every few decades, Levi's makes an item that is just perfect. Something that's both a milestone and a cusp between stages of historical, classic, and retro. But also something that is emblematic of the cultural times that it's in. That's the 1966 501. Now on Den and Denim. Give a subscribe and help the channel grow. 1966 was a heck of a year. Cigarettes started having warning labels. Cops started reading Miranda rights. Albums were just a list of masterpiece after masterpiece. Actors becoming politicians. Grinch stole Christmas. The counterculture movement has gone from beats to hippies. By now with Neil Cassidy having driven the further bus. LSD is germinating a change and self-reflection in the consciousness of the country and everything is ready to be torn apart. But a legend does not come apart at the seams. To the owner of this 501 gene, when Levi Strauss and company covered the back pocket rivets in 1937, Everyone thought that would solve the problem of rivets scratching their furniture when they sat down. But those copper rivets were tougher than they looked. After a few years of hard wear, they continued to break right through the denim, scratching things up again. By 1966, technology had caught up with history, and it was possible to bar attack the 501 jeans back pockets, replacing the back pocket rivets. The text on the pocket flasher indicates this change. This small change maintained the jeans' notorious durability while finally solving the decades-long furniture scratching issue. This particular style of 501 jean with bar tacks and a big E red tab only existed from 1966 to 1971. What does this mean for the 1966 501 jean? It means someone who hitchhiked their way to San Francisco in 1967 and bought a pair of 501 jeans was not only experiencing a once-in-a-lifetime event, but was wearing a unique pair of jeans, a pair which would change again when the summer of love was just faded memory. A Big E Red Tab the 1966-501 is the last year that you can commonly buy from the Levi's Vintage Clothing Collection with the Big E. There are 1967s and 71s, but those are very rare. The Jackron Leather-like patch. Jackron patches are better than leather in that they don't shrink as drastically and they keep the red print on them longer. The downside is that they crack and disintegrate after like a hundred washes or less. Noticing the details of the print, we'll see a lot of changes comparing them to the 55 or now the 1960s pairs. The every garment guaranteed slogan was removed between 63 and 65. And this is definitely one of the sadder moments in the episode. We start to see quality sliding. The text 100% cotton and WPL 423 appear on the patch for the first time. WPL is the wool production labor code. Big change in the double X. I like to call this the half double X. It has the same size 501 as before, but the double X is removed. However, there is a smaller 501 XX just above it. Historic pairs will say made in America. Levi's vintage recreations don't, even if they are made in America. 12 ounce red line salvage denim. But at this time, they took the red line exposure out of the inside of the watch pocket. The rivets perfected. I gotta start with some bad news about the rivets though. They're now made of aluminum on the inside face. Still copper on the outside. The awesome part, the rivets on jeans used to have a small amount of fabric peeking through. The fabric eventually wore down to bare metal, 
And the Levi's Vintage Recreations are great about recreating those details. And I love it in my historical collection. But think about it from a person's view back then, in the 1960s. What if you want clean looking rivets on your rigid pair? Now you can have them without any exposed fabric. Levi's tried this in the 1954 501Zs, but the only way they could do it at the time was to make the rivets concave. And they didn't look as nice, so they went back to the flat rivets with exposed fabric. Now, in 1966, they could make rivets the way Jacob always wanted to, with no fabric exposed and the rivets flat, yet smooth so they wouldn't cut your delicate digits. But that's all kind of null because of the next little detail, bar tacks. Now this is the big one for the episode and the year 1966, so I think it deserves its own chapter. Levi's whole brand, patent, and genius was the metal rivet at points of strain and garment. Rivets are stronger than the toughest stitching. Levi's experimented with how to replace the rivets with thread throughout its history. Historic items from the Lot 2 series would often have had heavy stitching at the points of strain like pockets. This was a cheaper alternative to the price of copper. They knew it wasn't as durable, but it was their budget line of the time. You want the best quality? Splurge a dime for the Lot 5. Then, like all things in the 20th century, the war happened. Copper was used in bullets, so Levi's took them out of the watch pockets in the S501 from 1944. They seemed to do the job. The watch pocket was never really a point of strain. The rivets on the pocket watch are more decorative and symbolic for Levi's. 20 years later, and the technology caught up. Levi's was able to make a suitable replacement for the rivets. In 1966 models, bar tacks are only used for the rear pockets. They're where the covered rivets will eventually wear the fabric down, exposing the metal, and that could scratch your furniture. This was a, a time when people started to wear jeans more commonly. They were no longer just your outdoor pants, but your school, restaurant, home, and soon to be office wear. There's no longer a cinch or rear rivets to scratch up that nice furniture. Eventually, bar tacks would take the next logical step and replace all the rivets on the garment. Bar tacks are durable. In fact, they can hold up to 400 pounds of strain. The choice for Levi's to leave rivets on their front pockets of the jeans is still functional, but mostly ornamental at this point. Remember, this is a company that started with the idea to sew a pair of pants the way you build a boat. This is my personal absolute favorite fit. It emulates the 1890 very well in the crotch room. The 66 fit is high rise without getting ridiculous. It's still a straight leg with an unnoticeable tapering. I recommend trying to buy your true waist size and then giving it a tub soak. But if you want to upsize a whole size, then it'll still fit you without a belt. It feels loose, but only slightly roomy. I don't recommend downsizing on these. Do at least your true fit, if not upsize a half a size or even a full size. Don't go much more than that. If you get real fit though, they are like a glove. It just, it makes you feel powerful and strong when you're wearing them and you're ready for any adventure your way. There are tons of variations of this. I tried to grab the main ones. However, 1966-501 hasn't been made in a few years. The Rigid is the most popular version and the only one you can currently buy on the site as of 2022. But if you come across a pair of Distressed, I recommend going for it. My Rigid were the first pair I ever bought and they are kind of my favorite still. I'm really trying to work in a nice honeycomb fade into all of it. Bright rents are 
the 1966 alternative to the new wash. It looks like rigid, but it's pre-shrunk and keeps its color longer. The medium wash of the bright rinse is just a nice alternative. Authentic Blue is a medium wash, no rips, some dirt stains, and nice creasing. Super Dark Rock are a dark wash, no rips, and a beautiful creasing in the crotch. This type of distression is commonly known as whiskering. Old Memory is a medium wash, faded knees, and creases on the back of the knees. Roughed Up has these odd vertical creasings going down. Mr. Kite, another medium or even a light wash. No rips, but these scuffs on the thighs and fading on the front of the legs. Greystone is just a beautiful pair of a light wash. Some fades going on, but hard to really tell. Clean looking. A very similar pair are the Ramblin' Man. There's a Pedion pair, which might be marked as double X. Four Elements and I, a dark wash. A Velzy-like pair with knee rips. An unknown pair with a high contrast wash that looks very sketchy and erratic and some light stitching on it. Another unknown pair with the vertical replaced bottom part of the leg, and Splashy, a dark wash with dirt stains and a replaced leg with black denim. Then for colors, we have Primal White, a cream colored pair. Wish I had them for my wedding. Black Tiger, which is blue denim dyed black and then worn down to be gray. And finally, Battery Liquid, rigid dyed black with white stain spots. Supposed to be like you touched a bunch of battery acid on it. The first pair I'd like to talk about are a historic pair of 1966. Let's call them the Double Tab. Because it's a goof at the factory where someone sewed an extra red tab in the left back pocket. It's a funny detail, and there's probably a few more floating around than one. From the Japanese recreations, there's a 1966-1967, 501E. E stood for extra large sizes, so anything above 36 waist would count as an E. Around 2007, there were a numbered limited edition from the LVC collection for 1966-501s. They were numbered out of 1,345, and there's no cool story or extra detail about it. Just looks like another pair of Distressed. I should warn you about the special edition 1966 jeans. These are not part of the LVC collection, nor do they have any of the 1966 historic details, such as a big E, selfish denim, correct patch text, or fit. But if you like them, then enjoy. As for the real LVC limited edition for 1966 501s, these came out in 2019 called the Harijuku. They are the first Japanese text 501s and really should have been the only. But then in 2021 and 2022, they remade the Japanese as Katakana text 501s for 1955 and 1947. Straight up highway robbery, I tells ya. 1966 deserves its own limited edition pair, and an awesome one at that. I propose the double tab pair, which is a historic pair from 1966 with an oopsie, but this is still a little small fries for a limited edition pair. Maybe a psychedelic Levi's print or redo the mirror pair from 76, but for 66? Let me hear your thoughts in the comments about what they should do for a 1966 limited edition pair to really celebrate that. There's a reason Yoshi included the 1966 in his book. This is the end of the classic Levi's era. 
The technology had advanced to make the strongest genes possible. And Levi's was still using the best quality materials. By taking off the double X and the slogan, every garment guaranteed, they had to win over the rough riding fans by continuing to make the highest quality, most durable pair of jeans. And they succeeded. This concept of winning over fans has another unique twist with the 1966 pair. Before 1960, Levi's really only had one or two models of jeans. The 501s, there used to be a before 1960, Levi's really only had one, maybe two pairs of jeans. The 501s. Now there used to be a budget model 201 and one for women 701. But the 505, 502, 551, denim family line, white Levi's, orange tab, and the pre-shrunks, they all came out in the 60s. Levi's marketing was pushing their newer items for a new generation. And for the most part, it worked. They sold tons. But thankfully, they didn't give up on their all time number one item, the 501 Gene. And neither did the fans. For once, which pair of Levi's you wore had a lot to say about who you were. Wearing white Levi's said you were preppy and conformist, but still down with the popular elements of the Cultural Revolution. Orange Tab said you a little freaky deaky. But the 501? That's what cowboys, criminals, poets, rockers, bikers, hippies, and beats, and anyone with a good sense to see that the straight leg button fly selvage is the only way to cover your legs. <laughs>